Welcome to our Miss Info Day educator webinar. We are sad that we couldn't all meet with you and your students on campus, but we're really happy that you could all be here with us today. And hopefully you will walk away with a lot of resources and things that you can take back to your classrooms and to your students. Um, I'm Liz Krauss, I'm the Miss Info Day coordinator, and I will be moderating today. And Today we are talking with Jevin West and Mike Caulfield. Jevin is an associate professor in the Information School. He's the director of the Center for an Informed Public. And he created the course Calling Bullshit at UW with his colleague Carl Bergstrom that teaches students how to spot misinformation with a focus on data reasoning. And Mike is the director of blended and network learning at Washington State University, Vancouver. And he developed the SIFT fact-checking method, and he's created uh, courses and materials that teach people how to fact-check online information using that method. So we are going to start today with a few of the questions that you all submitted, and um, then we'll open it up to more questions and comments. And if at any time during the webinar you have a question or a comment, we really encourage you to chat it in so that we can make sure that the conversation goes in a direction that's helpful to all of you. So please be vocal in those questions and comments, and we will be keeping an eye on the chat. So we're going to um, start with a question around resources. M many of you asked, what are the resources that I can use to teach my students these um, media literacy and misinformation skills. So we're going to start with this question of uh, what materials and resources would you immediately suggest? And um, Mike, why don't you get us started with that? Thanks, Liz. Uh, so we've developed a bunch of resources over the years. And I think uh, as time has gone on, we've come to see this, this resource question. Is probably one of the one of the most important uh, pieces to helping students to become uh, literate in this way. And one of the things that we've learned is, um, well, there's a lot of energy uh, with teachers and faculty wanting to teach this stuff. They feel like they need the support of resources that are pulling well chosen examples that are really pulling out the nuances of some of those examples. Um, and that they can sort of set up and run and then the teachers can do what they do best. They can facilitate that conversation uh, with the student rather than, uh, you know, try to set up these um, uh, individual uh, examples and walkthroughs and things like that. Uh, the most, uh, actually, I'm going to show you the second most recent thing that we've, now the third most recent thing we've done. Sorry, we've uh, created a lot of resources over the years and I, sometimes I do lose a little track. Uh, the check please materials are, a set of materials that we put together beginning of last year. I think uh, they rolled out um, rolled out sometime in in March of last year. This date stamps on all of this. You can fact check me on that. Um, but the check please uh, Star Wars uses. I think each lesson takes about. Uh, half an hour to 40 minutes. So it's not something that takes a whole bunch of time. And we treat this as an in, uh, what we call an induction course. That is, the idea is um, the students can actually walk through this in a self-paced manner and sort of get the basic skills uh, and then you can work with them in the classroom. Uh, like most of our materials, it is based around the SIFT model. Uh, the SIFT model is a moves-based model. I don't know if you're familiar with the idea of moves in pedagogy, but the idea is, uh, you know, moves are a set of things one can do when presented with a problem, right? Uh, it's it's sort of like strategies, but it's a little more concrete than strategies. It's it's very focused on, uh, you know, action on on different routes that one can take. Uh, and the four moves are uh, stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, trace claims, quotes, and media to the original context. I'm not going to go through all of those uh, today and go through the whole methodology. Uh, but we've created this in a way where there are lessons on each of these uh, each of these moves. So for example, if you come to investigate the source, 
after some introductory material, you get the Alexa enabled toilet prompt, right? Uh, and so this is a prompt where the students are presented with um, a text message they might get in a text chat uh, saying, great, now there's an Alexa microphone in the bathroom too. And something um, uh, saying that uh, there's now a $8,000 toilet that's Alexa enabled. Uh, and you ask the students, you know, is this, is this true or false? They go and they uh, use their particular, um, whatever their, their methodology is. Hopefully they borrow from the stuff we've shown. Um, and in this case, uh, when they go to the discussion, they'll find that this is actually true. There is an $8,000 Alexa, uh, you know, enabled uh, toilet. And the way these are sequenced, they're very often, we're looking at the things we've identified in our pre and post with student misunderstandings, and we're trying to target very specific things. So for instance, in this particular one, what we find is students fall back on something we call a plausibility filter. That is, they think they're critically thinking about something, uh, but what they're really doing is just saying, does this accord with my experience? Does this sound like something that I've heard of before, right? And so it has the feeling of critical thinking, but it's not. We're encouraging them to go out there, in this case, uh, check the source. There's a more recent set of materials. Uh, we just put this together. This just came out a few weeks ago. Uh, it's in French and English. It's uh, from a partnership with a Canadian organization called Civics, called Find the Facts. And this is a set of materials uh, that is all, uh, this particular set is all um, organized around uh, COVID-19 uh, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and uh, it's uh, pretty cool. <laughs> we work with uh, Jane uh, Lid Lid Lidovienko, uh, who is uh, one of the experts in tracking down fake news for BuzzFeed News, which is separate from BuzzFeed. Of BuzzFeed News. Um, she does a lot of the introductory pieces, uh, and then I walk through the, um, some of the methods. Now, one of the interesting pieces about it is uh, they're really uh, quite good at doing, uh, doing graphical explainers. And so uh, I guess I'll I have this a little small here. Um, but if you can see this, they'll, uh, in here, they actually go through and they show uh, the methods that you use to do these things uh, with a bunch of zooms and cuts and things like that. They just make it a little more evident to uh, students what they should be doing uh, when they're fact checking, uh, when they're fact checking materials. Um, there's a number of other materials out there. I, I uh, think that some of the stuff that uh, the News Literacy Project is uh, putting together, uh, especially more recently, uh, is, is quite good. Um, uh, Peter Adams has a newsletter called The Sift, which is not related to our methodology, but is also, uh, is also quite good. Um, but I'm happy if people have specific resources, questions, I'm happy to answer those later as well. I'll, I'll hand it over to uh, Jevin to talk about some of the things that, uh, that he has going. For a long time in science, data visualization has been the standard way of communicating complex ideas and complex um, information. And that's around us everywhere. And students see this in their social media feed as much as they do, um, as much as we do sort of in regular science world, which is where I come from. Uh, the problem is the popular, and popular media uses it too, but you know, maybe not so much training for reading those, these kinds of things. And there's an unlimited number of ways in which data can be misleading. Now, I do wanna emphasize, this is just one of many different points that we wanna make when we're trying to improve students' data reasoning, but charts engage students in ways that are different. So that's why I wanna focus on it today and give you some examples. So there has been this rise of charts, especially you know, in newspapers, but also in social media. Um, actually, we could even talk about some of the issues with this particular chart of charts, um, but it's, it's fun nonetheless. I, well, it, it's true nonetheless that, that charts are being used to communicate information. Today, we even use, we use data graphics for everything, even things we don't need. So MSNBC tweeted this out not too long ago. This was last year, I think, that Trump tweets mentioning Mueller's by name. And if you look, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, it's not a, not a real useful sort of graphic to be used. But the charts and ways of communicating have gotten much more sophisticated. And with that, uh, many ways in which um, charts can be misread and uh, misinterpreted. So if you look at this, uh, you know, this is, this is a paper that talks about um, how uh, how much we need to improve, I think, in, in education, in teaching students how to interpret graphs. So there was this, this, this particular study um, showed, and actually several studies 
since then have showed that students really struggle with interpreting even simple graphs like this. So about two thirds of American adults that were assessed with this particular chart had a very difficult time interpreting it. These are the exact questions. These are the, this is the chart that was used. It's just a, sta a standard scatter, uh, or scatter plot um, with a linear regression through um, the, uh, the data with average sugar consumption on the x-axis and average number of, of decayed teeth per person in different counties. And so you're, we're at, you ask individuals, uh, you know, what, what would be their answer to this particular question? You do this and, and it turns out most get it wrong, but it's actually 63% is not even a good number for this particular study because if you, if you even just guessed by random, you'd get it right 25% of the time. So it's actually even worse than that number entails. Turns out the answer to this one is that more people, sh sugar people eat, the more likely they're to get cavities. Pretty simple, but people struggle with it. So we talk a lot about, you know, uh, framing both um, lying and BSing um, in the literature, and we find different ways, even in graphical literature, in which that happens. So liars, they, according to you know, Harry, Harry Frankfurt, they know the truth, and they're sort of just misleading and trying to, to push you in the, the dire uh, direction away from truth, whereas BSers, uh, they don't really care, and they're just trying to persuade. So there's different kinds of graphs for that. So we have several different forms that you might, students might see, and they have a lot of fun with these. One is something that we, uh, we call a duck, which is building off of Edward Tufte's idea that it's a graphic that's taken over by decorative forms rather than the, the, um, the sort of main function should be, which would be distributing um, the story of the, the data itself. So one of the examples that's used in Tufti's book and others are these uh, from architecture, these decorative constructions that really um, are, don't, they sort of, it's form over function in, in other words. Um, and we have tons of these examples. I found some great architecture um, that sort of fit this, this mode. Um, but you know, many of you have seen these in UST, USA Today, of course, these USA Today made these famous where you get these graphics like, how many glasses of water do you drink a day? Well, okay, let me just try to sit here and look at this just for like, uh, you know, a, a minute before I, before I even, even, can even start doing assessments or what, this ma uh, what it's supposed to say. And we have literally hundreds of these in our files and students love going through this. And by doing this, they start to see that if communicating data and some sort of data story is the point, then you can get lost here. Now, this isn't necessarily misleading at all. This is just capturing our attention. Now, this one, I mean, this one has so many things wrong with it on messaging and not just the data visualization. I'll just sort of let this one sit, sit to the side. But um, again, it's really difficult. How can you, you know, is it the nails that are included here? The, the finger length, are they, do they correspond to those actual numbers? We do a lot of measurement of these things by pixel. It's off by these kinds. I mean, there's just so many things. I, I don't even need to go on. Now, circles, of course, are used all the time um, just because they're a nice way to fit certain kinds of figures. But what's the difference between, let's say, Turkey and Ukraine? Turns out that you know, people that study um, uh, visual perception know that it's really, really difficult to tell the difference between different, uh, you know, different circle circumferences and, and even harder for areas. So, I mean, these are, these, this is the kind of way that we students see information. Now, these again are not so bad. So we're kind of just having fun, but it's a way to pull the students in to thinking about this. Now, there's another type that we see a lot of, glass slippers. We do actually do a bunch of work on talking about the mathiness of data viz, because we actually make fun of all the mathiness we see um, in, in the world nowadays that has a bunch of math equations, but nothing around it. I'm gonna, because I wanna to try to do this in five minutes, so I'm gonna skip real quick, but they come in many different forms, in forms that are actually quite useful. The periodic table is one of the most beautifully designed data visualizations ever. Uh, and Venn diagrams can be incredibly useful. And of course, the, the subway maps are beautiful. Dendrograms used, if they're used the right way, are beautiful. But of course, they're used in ways that make no sense. But, you know, a periodic table of alcohol and typefaces. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing about the position that helps you predict another unknown um, uh, you know, an unknown typeface, for example, like the periodic table does with molecular, with, with elements. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. There's even the periodic table of periodic tables, which is, I think is really funny. Uh, like people use subway maps all the time, but, but the positions mean nothing in this space. And yet this is how we're sort of, sort of pulled in and, and sort of BSed by the methods. I'm, I'm skipping through, like I said, faster. Venn diagrams are, there's so many offenses of Venn diagrams online that I find that I just, it's, it makes me, um, yeah, well, it gives good material. Let's say, let's just put it that way. Um, the, uh, like this one was from the, Romney camp, or, uh, from the Romney campaign, I think it was. Yeah, so we have one, on one side, you have 
President Obama's advisors said stimulus would lower the unemployment rate to 5.6% by mid-2002. There's some sort of gap here and result unemployment rate is currently 8.2%. We can make a story about what that gap means, but it has nothing to do with the, the result and promise. But, but, that, but it isn't just on the right. This is on the left. This came out of Hillary Clinton's campaign, another Venn diagram. 90%, 90% of Americans, here's one diagram, 83% of gun owners support universal background checks. I, again, I can make stories and students love these stories that we make about this. And again, it makes them more critical of the things that they're seeing. Now, here's my favorite vendor at diagram. We actually used to, uh, there's a big, large company called Thomson Reuters. You get a lot of your AP things out of this one. Trust, partnership, and innovation performance and how they cross over with our values doesn't, uh, doesn't give me confidence in, in, in Thomson Reuters. All right, so I'm going to skip. I wanted to show you a few other things, but I do want to get to the last slide. Um, since we're in education, I figured we'd do this one. This is almost a parody of itself. Uh, this is um, uh, learning for life in our times. This is supposedly what we should be doing as educators. Uh, I, I've, I've still come up with different stories of what this means, but um, we'll just end it on that um, as a way of getting the discussion going.